Good evening and welcome to Pace IT's webinar this evening. Tonight we're going to be talking about CompTIA's A plus exam 220-802 and we're going to be talking about exam objectives 2.4, 2.5, and 2.6. I'm Brian Farrell and I will be your host this evening. I am an IT instructor for Edmonds Community College and I thank you for watching this webinar. So let's start by talking about what those objectives are. Uh, excuse me, objective 2.4 of the 220-802 exam deals with data destruction and disposal methods. In exam objectives 2.5 and 2.6 deal with securing wireless and wired networks. So how about we jump right in to exam objective 2.4, data destruction and disposal methods. And we're going to talk about why we need to be talking about this. Well, <clears throat> when hardware is being replaced, it is imperative that sensitive data is destroyed on the, on the original outgoing hard drive. Now, many companies have policies on what must occur to the drive and the storage media that have contained organizational data. Uh, some many do, many don't. As a qualified technician, it is your responsibility to know that policy and to follow it. Also, if your company or organization does not have a data disposal and destruction policy, you should get together with senior management and formulate one and then follow it. Uh, it has several advantages uh, and some legal ramifications. Now, one of the things that can occur is if you have a policy and you follow it, that means that that information cannot be used against the organization once its time period has lapsed. Uh, some data always has to be kept, but a lot of data is it's better to get rid of it. Get rid of it when you can. So now let's talk about some methods of data disposal. A lot of people think that by doing a standard format that you are destroying data and that's kind of a yes or no. Your standard format, what it does is it prepares a disk to receive a file structure as in FAT32 or nowadays NTFS or some of the other uh, file formats that are out there. Now a full format does the same thing. Uh, except it checks the drive for bad sectors. Now it really doesn't destroy any of the information that's contained on the disk. All it really does is replace its address. It removes the address. So it's a little bit harder to find, but there are tools that are out there that can unformat hard drives. Now you could write a bunch of zeros to the disk. That is fairly effective. Uh, but I'm going to talk about that a little bit more, but it's not completely, well, it can, it can be not effective as well. Now, a low-level format, now that's a different story. Now, modern drives are low-level formatted at the manufacturer. Uh, back in the good old days, good old days, late 90s, early 2000s, you could low-level format your own hard drive can't really do that anymore. When you do a low level format, what you're actually doing, you actually defines the position of tracks and sectors on the hard drive. Now that is an effective method of destroying data. It's just a whole lot harder on, on being able to do that nowadays. So let's talk about overwriting. That's writing ones and zeros to the disk. Um, no, actually, no. We'll start with overwriting. Oh, that's where you just write over the top of the data that's already there. Um, and what happens is you delete a file, then you write a new file, and it overwrit has overwritten the old location, but it still leaves traces of the old data behind, which can be recovered. 
Then there are dry, then there's drive wiping. That's where you delete the file. And then you overwrite the location multiple times with a changing binary pattern. Now that is a very effective method of sanitizing a hard drive. Now that process can be automated. As a matter of fact, there are, are there is some software out there that will do it for you right off the get go. Um, you might want to consider picking some of that up if this is going to be the method of data disposal that your company is going to use. Uh, last time I heard, the U.S. government figured that it took, uh, I'm trying to remember, it was either five or seven times of overwriting with random binary patterns before they considered a hard drive sanitized. Now let's talk about some physical means of destroying data. And the first one is the degaussing tool. Now this is the electromagnetic, electromagnetic method. Spinning hard, drive, spinning hard drives store data as electromagnetic signal. Uh, so it's magnetic in nature. Now a degaussing tool is a strong magnetic gun, a strong magnetic field, and it will scramble data. Now, they are fairly effective, but traces of the data may remain. The main advantage to using a degaussing tool is it's quick and easy. Another effective method is drilling. This is when you use a power drill to drill holes through the hard drive. So you drill it through the case, through the platters. You do this a couple of times. It makes it so the platters can't spin. It makes it so the data uh, cannot be recovered. It is fairly quick. It's a little bit harder than using a degaussing gun. Um, yeah, it could be a little bit more tricky or dangerous, you know, you never know, you might drill yourself. But it's still easier than sanding or grinding. This is where you take the drive apart and then you use a sanding tool or sandpaper and you actually grind off the media from the hard drive. Now it's really effective. I mean, once you do it, that data is never recoverable. But it is highly time consuming. So it costs you more money to do it, at least in time. Uh, one of the ways that companies are really going about it now is they're shredding their hard drives. Uh, when they shred their paper documents, a lot of those shredding companies actually have shredders that can take hard drives. Uh, it will completely destroy the drive. It is very easy to do. Because what you do is you take the hard drive out of the computer and you toss it into the shredder. But it can be costly. Um, like I said earlier, you can use a service to do it. That would reduce your capital expense and still get the hard drive destroyed. Now that covers it for the material in Objective 2.4 of the 220-802 exam for A+. Plus. Let's move on to 2.5 and 2.6, securing the wireless and wired networks. So let's talk about that. So whether you're running a wireless or a wired network, your network should have some security in place. And guess what? It's up to you to put that security there. Now, equipment manufacturers are in the business of selling the equipment, selling the product, and it's a whole lot easier to sell the product if the buyer doesn't have to have help setting it up. Well, what that means is that most networking gear for the small office home office does not come with security enabled. That's slowly changing. But... It's not all the way there yet. They do that to make it easy for the regular Joe to set up the equipment. So what that really means is that they're not secure. Or if they do come with security enabled, 
the defaults are there. And guess what? Defaults are easily known. They're easily found out. So one of the first things that you need to do when you're setting up security is change default usernames and passwords. Uh, they are very easily found. All you have to do is run a search on the Internet. And then if an attacker gains entrance to the administrative level of your equipment, guess what? It's no longer your network. It's now their network. Something that you might want to consider is enabling MAC filtering. Uh, and what that is is your media access control address is supposed to be unique. <coughs> Excuse me. It's also called your burned in address. Each device has at least one MAC. Uh, and you can make it so that your network will only allow certain MAC addresses on. <coughs> The only problem with that is there is such a thing as Mac spoofing. Uh, so while you think you might be secure, you're not as secure as you think, and Mac address filtering tends to get a little bit complicated. Uh, how many times do you go out and get something uh, that you put on your wireless network at home? Now, do you want to have to go into the administrative account and add the Mac address for that device? Uh, say you got a cell phone. I know that in my house with my kids, my wife and I, you know, I think we've got seven computers, uh, four phones, yada, yada, yada. I don't want to have to be responsible for managing all those MAC addresses. The other thing that you could, could do is you could assign static IP addresses to devices. Uh, this makes it, this also makes it more difficult for an attacker to gain entrance. Not impossible, just more difficult. Uh, and the advantage to that is you get to make your IP addressing scheme yours. Don't, don't allow the equipment to set it for you. So now let's move on. Ooh, there's that image. Hey, let's move on to some wireless. Uh, security measures, securing the wireless network. And first up, change the, change the SSID, the Service Set Identifier. Now this doesn't necessarily add security in itself, but hey, it will make it so that it's not the default. Another thing that you can do is you can disable the SSID. Uh, a lot of people think that secures their network. It doesn't. It just makes it a little bit more difficult to find. Uh, one of the things about wireless networks is it's broadcasting that SSID, whether you've got it hidden or not. So changing the default SSID and hiding the broadcast makes it a little bit more difficult for the attacker, but not impossible. Now let's talk about antenna and wireless access placement. This is another thing that doesn't necessarily add to security in itself, but it doesn't hurt either. Now, because of the nature of wireless, it goes everywhere. So your wireless access point should be placed in such a way that your coverage reaches the desired levels so you get the maximum amount of coverage that you want at the minimum power levels. While at the same time, minimizing coverage that you don't want. Uh, putting your wireless access point or your antenna by a window, what that really guarantees is that your signal is going to go beyond that window. It may not be too bad if it's going into your backyard, but you know what? If it's going out into your driveway, uh, don't do that to yourselves. Another thing that you can do is your radio power levels. So how far does your signal really need to reach? Now, most wireless access points nowadays let you have some control over your, the power of your radio signal. So what you might want to consider doing is setting up your wireless access point, taking your laptop outside into the driveway, and seeing if you can find your network. If you can, you might want to consider turning down the power on your wireless access points radio. 
the only true effective method of securing a wireless network is setting encryption. And this is a must if you want a secure network. Now your encryption level should be set at the highest level that your equipment can support. And if your highest level is WEP, Wired Equivalent Privacy, uh, then replace your equipment. WEP has been broken for a long time. Uh, as a matter of fact, in 2003, they came out with WPA, which is better than WEP. Uh, it's WPA with TK, TKIP, TKIP. Um, as the replacement for WEP, it's better than WEP, but it's broken too. What you should use at a minimum is WPA2 with AES. That's the Advanced Encryption Standard. That is the minimum level of encryption that you should use. And that is about the only way to truly guarantee <coughs> that your wireless network remains secured. Now let's talk about a wired network. Um, wired networks are a little bit more difficult because the attacker has actually got to gain physical access to your equipment to get onto your network. Now, in most cases, not a big deal. You know, you got that stuff locked up, I hope. But if you don't change your default username and passwords, guess what? Once he connects to your switch port or to your router, it's now his switch port or his router. It's no longer yours. You need to not only change default names, usernames, and passwords, but you need to disable any unused ports. Uh, so that is about the only effective way to prevent somebody from hijacking your wired network. As far as physical security goes, limit access to the network switches and routers. Don't make it easy for them. Uh, limit access to the wiring closets as well, the patch, the, the patch panels, and the termination points for your network. Don't let them get in there. Uh, if an attacker can easily get physical access to your network equipment, then again, it's not really yours anymore. It's now his. If you're lucky, all he's going to do is walk off with it. If you're unlucky, he's going to figure out how to hack it, and now your network is vulnerable. Well, guess what? That concludes this information on CompTIA's A-plus exam 220-802, objectives 2.4 through 2.6. Now, on behalf of Peace IT, thank you for watching this webinar. And maybe I will see you again.